Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. When patients are diagnosed with COVID-19, they are required to self-isolate. Some of these patients may be at significant risk for complications and may require comprehensive assistance at home. Providing that support is the goal of Mayo Clinic's remote patient monitoring program. And here to discuss that with us today is Dr. Ryan Hurt. Dr. Hurt is an internal medicine physician at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and he has helped to form the team that manages and provides support to COVID-19 patients here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester and throughout the Mayo Clinic health system. This has been particularly interesting to me since I had a colleague here at work share with me their story of having remote monitoring. They explained that they had had a COVID test which had rapidly come back positive and that they had been overnighted equipment such as a pulse oximeter and a blood pressure cuff, et cetera, for uh, home monitoring. And I was so intrigued by that. Can you tell us a little bit about the team that you lead, who composes it and uh, what you do? So our COVID frontline care team formed in the early days of the pandemic by our infectious disease colleagues in partnership with uh, us in general internal medicine. We had early discussions about how are we going to take care of COVID positive patients from the whole journey through the disease process, from the beginning to the end. And so we built a team based on in general internal medicine physicians as well as our nursing colleagues uh, here in general internal medicine as well as our connected care uh, nursing colleagues. And so our COVID frontline care team to date has, has treated over 14,000 positive patients from Mayo Clinic Rochester to Basel, the health system. Um, and so what the team does is once you, your description of your, your friend's um, situation is once a patient's positive, that positive result comes to our team in an in-basket through our, our EMR. Our, one of our physicians uh, then reaches out to that patient and risk stratifies them based on their age, their comorbidities, such as COPD and lung issues. Uh, and then we also work with our nursing colleagues to contact that patient um, right after to then instill the principles of quarantine and the importance of that um, at that moment. And so that's when the dis decision comes into whether or not we uh, place a patient on a remote monitoring uh, sort of package. What is meant by a remote monitoring package? What would a patient expect if they were going to be remotely monitored? If we think a patient is high risk and falls into one of the high risk categories, like I said, such as COPD or has an arrhythmia or heart failure or coronary artery disease or one of these sort of risk factors with COVID that we've identified, we would then um, partner with our connected care team, uh, which is a specialized group of nurses and send the patient a, a, a bundled package, which will be a Bluetooth enabled uh, device packet. They would get a pulse oximetry again to monitor ox oxygenation. Uh, they would get that also, we can also monitor heart rate with that. We also send them a Bluetooth enabled blood pressure monitoring device uh, in, a, in addition to a, a temperature a thermometer that has enabled uh, them to upload all that information to our connected care nursing colleagues. There is a separate uh, package for those that are low risk. We have in the past, uh, and this is probably the scenario that your uh, friend had, was they, they will get then a self-monitoring package where they have a non-Bluetooth enabled pulse oximetry and a thermometer that we will send to them. And then what they do is they report to us those values through the portal. Uh, to our team. I was impressed by, by the number of patients that you indicated had been enrolled in this program. And I'm wondering, is this something that's COVID specific? So you formulated all this rapidly at the beginning of COVID or are there other uses for it? In our division, we use this obviously mainly for COVID, but one of the great concepts that COVID has brought out is keeping these patients and using this technology to keep patients at home, right? And so instead of having these patients having to come to the ER, um, we can monitor them using these packages in the home setting, right? So we, we, and once they, if they have problems or they're struggling, they have a, we have a nursing line, they reach out to us 24 seven, uh, but we're also monitoring their data as well. And if we need to escalate their care, 
to the ER hospital, we can do that, but it helps us keeping them at home, keeping them isolated and, and you know, not then spreading obviously COVID to others, including our healthcare workers. But to your que earlier question, yes, it's used in heart failure and it's used in other disease processes with that same principle. The, the principle is to keep them at home and not necessarily bring them uh, to utilize hospital resources when we don't have to. So it's like a virtual hospital in many ways. Patients, some of the things they dislike the most are, are looking for parking spaces and waiting for, for appointments. And so to be able to connect so quickly like that seems amazing. What do the patients say about the program? When we talk to patients about their experience, I think it gives them reassurance, right? It gives them reassurance that a team is, is watching them and monitoring them. And with a, with a disease that has a 2% or so mortality, especially escalating with the high risk patients, I think it gives them reassurance that they're being followed and cared for 24 seven throughout the disease process. And so patients, I think overwhelmingly have found this to be favorable as far as the remote monitoring package, that Bluetooth enabled package. Now, like all patients, the less intense package for low risk patients that really are maybe even having very few symptoms, Having them enter their data twice a day for 10 to 14 days throughout the disease process, I think their feedback has been that it may not add that much value to their care. Uh, but some think, boy, Mayo is really going above and beyond and caring for me. But it's really key in those high-risk uh, patients, I think. And it really, I think, adds value both for the patient perspective, but also the physicians as well. We, we feel like we do a good job of taking care of them. That would have been my thought about patients' reaction that, wow, somebody is looking in on me. And um, so I'm getting, I'm getting some care at home. That's really interesting. So what symptoms do you ask them to look for? And what do you expect from the vital signs? I mean, what would, what would be concerning? Especially the remote monitoring package, again, those that are high risk. We know that certainly certain disease states uh, increase uh, the morbidity and mortality of these patients. So that's why physician involvement, I think, is very important. So up front, our, our physicians do a great job of risk stratifying, kind of really talking about what sort of symptoms they are having at baseline, because not every patient is the same as far as what symptoms they have. We tell them about, we educate them about the remote monitoring package, as does our remote monitoring and connected care nursing team. Uh, we talk about symptoms as far as, you know, shortness of breath, chest pressure, those sort of worsening cough. Obviously, the loss of uh, sense of smell and taste is something that has been associated with, with our patients like everybody else uh, nationwide. Um, but we, we ask them to watch some of these uh, symptoms that we would view as uh, really requiring us to escalate care, and it revolves around a lot of the uh, respiratory and chest sort of complaints. You ask people to put in their symptoms and vital signs twice a day. Is that automated um, the way it is reviewed or does a human being have to go in and look at everyone's vital signs or is there something that triggers them to come to the attention of your team? So the remote monitoring package for the high-risk patients are monitored by our connected care team. Uh, the nurses are actively monitoring that data because it's Bluetooth and so then they, they, our nurses and connected care then will escalate to our physician team you know when they kind of sense that something is is going wrong. The low-risk patients that we have them self enter data, that stuff, though that's data that we review uh, as physicians and nursing, nursing as well, both our nurses and GIM and connected care. What kind of more comprehensive care can you provide at home? So if you see perturbations or you know, changes in someone's vital signs that look like they're becoming more ill, must they all come into the hospital? No, and I think that's the value of this program, right? The kind of the hospital uh, at home sort of scenario, if we did not have this sort of care model, um, you can imagine that, let's say somebody had a slightly worsening cough and they, they hadn't been really educated about this upfront by our excellent nurses and our great physician staff. You know, they may then automatically seek out care and either call their primary care who, you know, everybody's been there as a general internist or a family practitioner that if a patient with COVID calls you and has any escalation of symptoms, they may, you know, the safe bet is just to send them on to the ER. And so this team allows us as internists and, and nursing care, both in our GIM nurses and our connected care uh, colleagues to really make an assessment about which sort of patients we need to send to the ER to really protect our resources in the ER as well as our hospital staff 
we do also often send our patients to sort of a, a different level of care. Our colleagues in community internal medicine run respiratory COVID clinics in the community. And, and these are also in the health system. The model we're discussing here is virtual, right? It's all done in their home setting. And so we have a number of options. The physician can use their medical judgment to then appropriately send patients where they feel that they're needed to be seen. Okay, so this isn't a program where like a nursing care would go into the home um, if the patient needed more care. They, the patient would then be referred to be seen by someone. With that sort of um, aspect, can be done virtually, can be done with phone calls from physician staff and or nursing. But if we feel that we need to escalate the care, then we will go to either a COVID respiratory clinic or um, emergency room as needed. How do you know and how do patients know when they don't need to be monitored any longer? So we do have a process for releasing uh, patients from our care, really reassure the patients that we're looking after them from start to finish. And so during that release um, sort of evaluation at the end is when we make that decision, you know, are you well enough to be you know, released back uh, and out of quarantine into the community. The other thing I, I didn't mention is we really partner with our local public health colleagues. So as you can imagine, since we're monitoring all the positive cases in, in the community, as well as at our institution, we're able to partner with our public health department, both our local pu public health departments, but also our state health departments in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. Communicate with them on a regular basis, updating them on trends we're seeing, whether we're seeing you know, positive cases and clusters, we're able to help kind of connect that positive test with the contact tracing you always hear about in the news. And we do that by being able to respond to the positive test very quickly and thus making public health's job much easier. Truly connected care with so many teams working together. No, it's a great example of multiple uh, specialties, like again, our colleagues in ID, internal medicine, community internal medicine, um, and us as general internal medicine here at Mayo Clinic Rochester, but as well as connecting with public health. It's been a great example of how uh, multidisciplinary, uh, both specialty, but also different disciplines can get together to take care of these patients. Dr. Hurd, I know that your team is very busy caring for our local patients here, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how your team helps to care for our destination patients too, and ensure that it is safe for them to come back to Mayo Clinic for their care. So in addition to taking care of the positives in the community, another important aspect of our team is if a patient were to come to Mayo Clinic and, and the process we have set up for them is if they're going to have a procedure or an aerosol generating test, they would then uh, be tested with our PCR test. And so our team uh, then is responsible for monitoring those patients. And so if they're positive, if it, let's say a patient was coming for a surgery, uh, and was positive 24 to 40 hours prior to that surgery, our team then responds to that positive case and does a similar process I described with the community patients. We then tell them that because you're positive, we're going to have to have you not be in our uh, building. We're going to educate you about quarantine, and we're going to have to reschedule your appointments. And what that does is it ensures that our staff then uh, are, remain safe and free from COVID, and it allows us to take care of those patients that need to come to Mayo Clinic by uh, deferring uh, patients that are positive to a later date. And that just keeps us all safe. Would those patients be required to stay in the community or, or do they travel home? What happens if someone comes here and is diagnosed? And early in the pandemic, we had a situation where a patient had traveled here and had been positive and we had to, because they were from uh, out of state, we actually work with that patient and the local health department to quarantine them. We do the same sort of thing. We risk stratify them, make sure they're low risk. Um, and if we feel that they're safe to proceed to go home in their, let's say their car, that's something we talk about. But again, traveling by air, we really uh, follow a lot of guidance from our public health colleagues and, and really not recommend that, obviously. Really work with public health in these sort of cases about what to do with them after they're uh, positive in the community. I think that's really reassuring both to those within the community and to people who wish to come to our community for care, that, that you're having a, such a careful care of anyone who is diagnosed, regardless of where they are from. We're trying to keep the community safe. That's wonderful. It allows us to then obviously have a safe practice for patients coming here 
uh, for their care, allowing them to get the procedures and surgeries that they uh, require. You're working with a bunch of wonderful people and we're so grateful to them for taking care of all these patients with COVID-19. I lead it, but it's really the, the people in our group. We have desk staff that are in the, in the team. We have nursing staff, we have administrators. And again, the physicians sometimes get all the credit, but the credit really is to the whole team. And we understand that this has just been a tireless job for the last several months. So thank you so much. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic internal medicine physician, Dr. Ryan Hurt for sharing with us today how he and his team remotely monitor patients with COVID-19. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu. Thanks for listening and be well.